Now I will speak to the rest of you, though I do not have a direct command from the Lord. If a fellow believer has a wife who is not a believer, and she is willing to continue living with him, he must not leave her. And if a believing woman has a husband who is not a believer, and he is willing to continue living with her, she must not leave him. For the believing wife brings holiness to her marriage, and the believing husband brings holiness to his marriage. Otherwise your children would be not be holy, and now they are holy. But if your husband or wife who isn't a believer insists on leaving, let them go. In such cases, the believing husband or wife is no such bound to the other. For God has called you to live in peace. Don't your wives realize that your husbands might be saved because of you? And don't your husband realize that your wives might be saved because of you? Each of you should continue to live in your uh, in whatever situation the Lord has placed you and remain as you were when God first called you. Okay? Uh, this is my rule for all of the churches. For instance, a man who has who was circumcised before he became a believer should not try to reverse it. And the man who was uncircumcised when he became a believer should not circum become circumcised. Now, for it makes no difference whether or not a man has been circumcised. The important thing is to keep God's commandments. Yes, each of you should remain as you were when God called you. Are you a slave? Don't let that worry you, but if you get a chance to be free, take it. And remember, if you were a slave when the Lord called you, and are now free in the Lord, and if you were free when the Lord called you, and now a slave of Christ, God paid a high price for you. So don't be enslaved by the world. Each of you, dear brothers and sisters, should remain as you were when God first called you. Now regarding your question about the young women who are not yet married, I do not have a command from the Lord for them, but the Lord in His mercy has given me wisdom that can be trusted, and I will share it with you. Because the one, because of the present crisis, I think it is best to remain as you are. If you have a wife, do not seek to end the marriage. If you do not have a wife, do not seek to get married. But if you do, do get married, it is not a sin. If a young woman gets married, it is not a sin. However, those who get married at this time will have troubles, and I am trying to spare you those problems. Okay, don't let me say this, dear brothers and sisters. The time that remains is very short, so from now on, those with wives should not focus only on their marriage. Those who keep or would, who rejoice or who buy things should not be absorbed by their weeping, or their joy, or their possessions. Those who use the things of the world should not become attached to them. For this world, as we know it, will soon pass away. I want you to be free from the concerns of this life. An unmarried man can spend his time doing the Lord's work and thinking how to please him. But a married man has to think about his earthly responsibilities and how to please his wife. He interprets his interests are divided. In the same way, the woman who is no longer married or has never been married can be devoted to the Lord and holy and body and spirit. But a married woman must think about her earthly responsibilities and how to please her husband. I am saying this for your benefit, not to place restrictions on you. I want you to do whatever you, whatever will help you serve the Lord best, with as few distractions as possible. But if a man thinks that he is treating his fiancée improperly, and will inevitably give in to his passion, let him marry her as he wishes. It is not a sin, but if he decided firmly not to marry and there is no urgency, and he can control his passion, he does not he, he does well not to marry. Okay? So the person who marries his fiancé does well, and the person who doesn't marry does even better. The wife is bound to her husband as long as he lives, and if her husband dies, she is free to marry anyone she wishes, but only if he loves the Lord. But in my opinion, it would be better for her to stay single, and I think I am giving you counsel from God's Spirit when I say this. May the Lord have a blessing to the reading here and doing with mighty powerful and magnanimous word. I just read to you Corinthians 7. This is Corinthians 7. Okay.
Okay. Uh, I'm ready, so now... Uh, Uh, Proverbs 18.22 says, He who wants a white a good thing and abstains, obtains favor from the Lord. Ecclesiastes 9.9 9, the River Translation says, Live happily with the woman you love through all the meaning, all the, all the meaning, meaningless days of life that God has given you under the sun. The wife God gives you is your reward for all of your earthly toil. May the Lord add a blessing again to the reading here of this mighty powerful and magnanimous word. Now, loving yourself is also an essential quality of God. Love, as described in the Bible, is quite different from the love as espoused by the world. Biblical love is selfless and unconditional, whereas the world's love is characterized by selfishness. In the following passages, we see that love does not exist apart from God and that true love can only be experienced by one who has experienced God's own love firsthand. Have you experienced God's love firsthand? Romans 13, 9 to 10, the commandments, do not commit adultery, do not murder, do not steal, do not commit, and whatever other commandment there may be, are summoned up in this one rule, love your neighbor as yourself. Love does not harm, Love does no harm to its neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. John 13, 34-35 says, A new command I give you, love one another, as I have loved you, so that you must love one another. By this all men will know that you are my disciples, if you love one another. First John 4, 16-19 says, And so we know and rely on the love God has for us. God is love. Whoever lives in love lives in God and God in him. In this way, love is made complete among us so that we will have confidence on the day of judgment. Because in this world, we are like him. Okay. There is no fear in love, but perfect love drives out fear. I said that before. Because fear has to do with punishment. And the one who fears is not made perfect in love. We love because he first loved us. The statement, love your neighbor as yourself, is not a command to love yourself. Okay, I'm sure you understand that by now. But it is, a, it is natural and normal to love yourself. You know? But a lot of people don't. You'd be surprised at how many people actually hate themselves. They look in the mirror and they don't like what they see. You know. They can have all the finest of clothing, you know, most expensive stuff, and they still hate themselves. They know the way they look. They see themselves in the mirror for one reason or another. And for this reason, that hate passes on to other people. But there is no lack of self-love in our world. There shouldn't be. You know, uh, I should say there is little, you know, uh, because there is some, there is, there is self-love, you know, I, I mean, you know, well, there, there, there's no lack of it, yeah, I guess you're right, there's no lack of it, I mean, that, there's, I should say there's, uh, there is some lack of self-love in our, in your world, in our world. The command to love your neighbor as yourself is essentially telling you to treat other people as well as you treat yourself. You know. Um, of course there's some people, like I said, that you don't they don't treat themselves good. And to them that may be their comfort zone. Not saying, as I said before, that you enjoy that way of living or that way of behaving. It's just that you're used to it. So now it becomes comfortable for you. And rather than you try to seek outside of that, you rather remain comfortable in your dysfunction. You see, you hate yourself, you don't, or maybe you don't hate yourself, you don't like what you see in the mirror, you don't like yourself for one reason, you don't like the way you act, the way you talk, the way you dress, the way you look, you know, the things you say, you know what I'm saying? 
And but yet you continue to remain in your comfort zone, in that dysfunction of not liking yourself, instead of seeking outside of that dysfunction to try to change and improve it. And that would be getting a hold of God's love. You know, letting the Lord love you and love you, as I said, in other passages and other sermons I preached. Love is a many splendid things, as many people have, have said, and there's a song that says that. You know, love is nothing to play around with. You know, we women should be more telling these men, you know, about love rather than just lust. You know, we should be looking for a husband rather than a, a somebody just to keep your bed warm. You know, or just somebody to you know, your baby mama, your mama baby, your baby daddy, whatever. We need to be thinking of more long-lasting foundational relationships rather than superficial relationships. Because when you serve God, we don't serve a superficial God. We serve a God who is, if you can use the word permanent, you know, you know, he's everlasting to everlasting. You know, he's not, he's not somebody that's going to come and fly by night and fly by day. He's here for good. And his love is everlasting. What he does, what he says, his promises are his good. And, you know, this is in the good of God. You know, there's nothing to play around with. It's foundation. What we do for God will last. You know, the things of the world are temporary, but what we do for God will last. You know, so we're, we're talking about holding on to something that's that's really, you know, that, that, that can last, you know, that can actually improve us. You know, you start seeking outside of that dysfunctional relationship or that dysfunctional lifestyle that you're living or that you've become comfortable in. And now you sort of treat it, you you're inching out of that, you know, little, little cocoon of yours. And you say, you know what, Lord, I'm going to trust you now. You know, I want to depend on you. I want to seek you. I'm going to put my faith in you, my hope in you. You know, I mean, I'm just going to lean on you, Lord. You know, I just, I, I, I forsake all of this for the sake of uh, trusting you, letting you lead me and guide me. You know, and you know that there's going to be a period of quietness and maybe even some suffering along with that. You know. Nobody promised you a rose garden, baby. <laughs> you know, what is that? I beg your pardon? You know, I never promised you a rose garden. You know, and you probably won't get one. Okay? So don't be thinking that you're going to get a rose garden, that things are going to be creatures and cream, honey, because they're going to be far from that. Especially in the beginning. You know, when your edges are rough. Okay? Uh, what we definitely need at some point to step out of that, you know, it's not healthy to stay in that comfort zone uh, too long, especially when the discomfort, when, when the comfort it leads to discomfort, and it pulls you away from God. You know, you have to get uncomfortable so that you can now move into your next level of anointing. Okay, that's why God sometimes sticks thorns in our flesh. You know, get up out that comfort zone. Get up. You know, shuts the door on you. You know what I mean? And then, you know, all kind of stuff start happening. You know, move you about of that, you know, frazzle your, ruffle your your edges a little bit, you know. Be like, you know, you'd be all comfortable thinking that everything is going to go the same today. And all of a sudden now you're, you're put in a position where things have changed dramatically. You know, all of a sudden, well, why did they, you know, what's the matter with you? Well, you know, I've been doing it like this all along, and now you all of a sudden you're going to come and change it? You know, yes, that's God sticking the thorn in your flesh. Get up out that comfort zone. Time for you to move. You're growing mushrooms down in there. Okay? <laughs> Scripture never commands us to love ourselves. It assumes that we already do, but like I said, a lot of us don't love ourselves. And a lot of us don't even know what love is. A lot of us, you know, we, we say the word love out of our mouth too loosely. And we use it in its wrong context, in its very improper context. Because if you study God and His love, then you know He's, he's a solid, He's solid, you know. I mean, to have a man, like, you know, just to get display the love on you. I mean, just somebody to just love you, you know, for who you are. You know, no matter what you look like in the morning. <laughs> you know, you got uh, all down your face and whatnot, you know. And whatnot, and you do not look nothing like what you did the night before when you went to bed. You know, ladies, please tighten up. You know, 
I was in the kitchen touching and make up water for you go to bed. Leave it on, let it wipe off as you sleep. You know, because you're not going to take my makeup off, otherwise it's going to get on my pillow. Yeah, your husband might not be there either. Because he'll always look at you and say, where, where, where's my wife? Where's my girlfriend or whatever? That's just the person that I, I was just talking to. You know? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? what you want regardless. Because you know us, us women out here of color, we have to do some extra special steps in order to keep ourselves looking beautiful. You know, some people have naturally long, beautiful hair, and they don't have to do very much effort in terms of keeping it long and beautiful. Um, but we have to do extra special stuff to our face, to our hair, to our body, so that we can stay lustrous. Okay, and that's a word that's seldom used. You know, you want your man to stay in love with you. You want him to love you. You don't want him to, to his attention to be deterred to any other woman or any other any other person. Because nowadays, you know, they can go people can go both ways these days, and they can actually get married. You see, we know that's an abomination. But you know, we want to stay in love. You know, and see, there's the love. You know, loving yourself. When you love yourself, when you, let's say for example, you go to the store, you know, and you you meet somebody, that could be a potential friend or a potential, you know, a husband, if it's, yeah, you know, mate, whatever, you know, I'm dealing, I'm talking about it from God's point of view, from God's word. So for women, it could be a potential husband, for men, it could be a potential wife. You know, everybody that you meet could be somebody potentially, you could preach to it, you could you can deliver a word to them and say, hey, you know what? And do a word of encouragement that, you know, they never was expecting. And then all of a sudden, wow, you brightened up their day. You made them feel better as a person. And God will reward you. You better believe he's going to reward you for that. Because now, what are you doing? You're acting out of love. You're learning how to love yourself when you learn how to love other people. You know, like I said, loving somebody else does not mean you've got to go to live with them. you got to give them a moment. It just means that you're acting the way God would act. You're doing what God would do. You're saying what he would say. Okay? So, you know, you're acting out of love. You're showing them love. How would God show his love? you, you got to figure that out. Ask him. Talk to him. Read the Bible. Get a copy of my book. Now, in Jesus' parable of the Good Samaritan, okay, there was, one, there was only one who showed himself to be a true neighbor to the man in need. Okay? Uh, the Samaritan in Luke 10, 30 to 37, there were two others. You remember the story, right? A priest and the Levites who refused to help the man in need. Their failure to show love to the injured man was not the result of loving themselves too much, too little. It was the result of loving themselves too much and therefore putting their interests first. And of course, in today's society, like I said before, you got to be careful about that. Okay, we know that people are in need. We know that people need. But, you know, uh, you know, there's, there's organizations now that we have for, 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 to help you, you know. I think that if you really want help, then you go to those organizations. Maybe you're getting what you need from them, and you've gotten all you can get. Well, then there's, there's other ways of helping, you know. There's somebody out there that can help. There's other you know, organizations. Um, but you just got to be careful about it in today's society, like I said before, in terms of helping strangers. We know that you want to help them, you know, have the love in your heart, but you don't want anything bad to happen to you as a result of you trying to help them. Now, we are to take our eyes off of ourselves and care for others, that the Word of God tells us, instructs us to do. Christians, the maturity demands it. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but of each to the interests of others. Proverbs, uh, uh, Philippians 2, 3, and 4. Now that's what I'm saying when I say you, when you go to the store, when you go somewhere, you're on the street, you're in your car at the light, and you know, you meet up with somebody or you see somebody, you know, might be asking you for something. You know, that person, you know, you, you could really need. Or they could just be asking because they want to get, you know, something else. <clears throat> but nevertheless, you know, you have to act treat it as love. And I'll, I'll talk more about it. You know, you can get a copy of the book. 
which I've explained in a lot of different segments about love. But how do you act out of love to a stranger who you think could potentially do you harm? Okay, so we're going to talk uh, more about that as we continue. But according to this passage, love, remember I said perfect fear can't stop love. Uh, I mean perfect love can't stop fear. So there's no fear in love. Okay, so you know, that's, that's, that's one of the answers to that question right there. But according to the passage, loving others requires humility and valuing of others. And a conscious effort to put others' interests first. Anything less than this is selfish and vain and falls short of the standard of Christ. Okay, none of the this should be taken to mean that we should see ourselves as worthless. Uh, the Bible teaches that we are created in the image of God and that fact of, that fact alone gives us great work. Uh, Luke 12, 7. Okay, the uh, balanced biblical view is that we are God's unique creation. Loved by God in spite of our sin and redeemed by Christ. In his love we can love others. We love others based on God's abiding love for us in Christ. In response to this love, we share it with all who we come in contact with. Um, in one way or another. Okay, with our neighbors, someone who is worried that he doesn't love himself enough, with the wrong focus. Uh, his concern biblically should be his love for God and his love for his neighbor. So, it's something we want out of the way so that we can be outwardly, so we can love outwardly as we want. Okay. Uh, we're, we're not saying that you don't care about yourself or that you don't take care of yourself. You know, definitely you take care of yourself. You know, that that's number one. You take care of yourself. You do what you got to do for you. You make sure that you're taken care of because God is going to take care of us as well. Uh, but when you see somebody in need, yes, you want to help them, you know, but the situation may not allow you to. So there are other ways that you can do it. There are plenty of ways that you can help somebody, you know, and it's not always about giving them money. You know, it's about what kind of help that they need. You know, how can you help them? What can you do for them? You know, what is, is it that they need for you to do, you know? And then, of course, you know, sometimes, you know, an encouraging word, saying something to somebody that they ain't never heard before, I love you could brighten up the day and turn their whole life around. Okay? Instead of them being a murderer, now they're a manager. Instead of them being a, uh, um, you know, dating someone of the same sex, now they're a lecturer or some, you know, something. They're a teacher. They've turned their dysfunction into a business because of that encouraging word that you've given them. Everything's going to draw up. And I want to thank you again today. My name is Dr. Sacred Black. I'm a licensed preacher. My name is Minister. And I have my PhD in Sacred Biblical Studies. I'm available for public engagements. I'm a psalmist. And I'm the author of this book. I ask you to get a copy of it. It will be available shortly on Mons and Nobles as well as Google Play Books. You can always email me or message me on my YouTube channel for further information. And I want to ask you to holler this is Dr.